I don't think we've got any more in the I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you for coming. There might be a couple of late arrivals, uh, but we'll let them uh, sneak in. But uh, we want to be uh, cognizant of your uh, being on time and uh, get uh, through our program, like I said, in an hour. So I would like to probably reintroduce uh, Interim Dean Scott Safransky to most of you. Uh, I applaud the fact that the Dean is willing to come to these events and, and meet prospective students um, and share with you uh, a little bit about his vision for the college and our program. So, Scott, I'll turn it over. And I, and I come to these, you know, this first half hour, I come as a professor. I like to meet potential students. And I, I've met students here who I wound up seeing in class uh, in a couple of occasions. I'm, I'm not teaching in, in the part time MBA program, but I've got a couple of occasions right now. But I've got a couple of occasions where I've met somebody on, you know, like, what is this, Wednesday night? Yeah. Yes. Have, a chance. have a holiday week, you don't know what day it is. But I meet somebody on Wednesday night and next Monday or whatever, they're in my class. So so it's fun fun to have this opportunity, and that's why I'm really here. Um, I think all I'm going to say, if we're going to keep Jim on, on schedule, I can't talk too long. But I do very much want to welcome you. Uh, we can probably make jokes about St. Louis weather but uh, and a lot, but you came out on a really beautiful night to be outside, and I appreciate your being in here instead. If it was miserable, we'd probably thank you for coming in in miserable weather or whatever, but we're still very glad you came. Um, you know, St. Louis University's Cook School of Business, we've been around for a long time. Our MBA programs have been accredited since 1948. Um, we have really, really strong ties with the community. We, we bring folks in from the community all the time. We've got a number of people from the community that come and teach in our programs. We've got faculty who are out in the community doing consulting work. Uh, we've got uh, executives and managers on boards in, in all departments. Our programs are designed with their help. So we are really tied into the business community, and I think that's that's really important. That's that's a real, real key part of our DNA. Who we are. Um, we're also professionally accredited by AACSB International. That is the premier uh, accreditor worldwide. There are a couple of others in Europe that also accredit, but but AACSB International is premier accreditor. Um, we are one of slightly over 500 schools now that are accredited. That may sound like a lot. But when you realize there are about 3,000 business programs that offer degrees in the United States alone, uh, and this is a worldwide accreditor, that really puts us in an elite group. Um, and one thing that I always like to point out is you're looking, you know, you should look and you should try to, try to find the program that really fits you. And try to get the people here, the students, the alumni, uh, the staff, uh, <coughs> trying to meet our staff who just came today, uh, the staff, that they can answer your questions. And, as you're asking questions and as you're talking to, to, to folks from different schools, you know, do your best. Find the right program for you. I hope it's us, but if it isn't, find 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 the good match for you. But I really encourage you to look at AACSB accredited schools. And the four in the St. Louis area are us, Washington University, University of Missouri St. Louis, and SIU Edwards. Those are the four accredited AACSB accredited programs. So look for those sorts of things. Um, uh, again, welcome. We're glad you're here. We've got lots of support for you. And if you've got questions after tonight, I know they're going to tell you who you can call and who you can talk to. And I encourage you very, very strongly to do that or come and talk to me, although I've already proved to several of these folks that I can't answer really specific questions. <laughs> so have a good evening, and, and, and thanks for being here. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Pat. Yes, yes. Well, again, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jim Mast, and I'm the Assistant Dean and Director for the Graduate Programs in the John Cook School of Business. So on behalf of everyone in the building, welcome if this is your first time either on campus or in our business school. Um, I will have a lot of help tonight in our, in our brief presentation. Uh, in the back row, in the white dress, is my colleague and our Associate Director, Susie Hartman. Uh, who is also an alum of the program. To her left is our newest employee who actually is still off the clock and will start in our office next Monday. But she was gracious enough to come tonight and validate the decision. We know she made the right one. That's Christy Collins. And then uh, in this closer row, Barb Gradala is Director of Career Resources. Uh, that's an important, important part of what we do in the business school. So she'll tell you a little bit about the services that are provided and maybe a little bit about the strategies that are employed by business students. And finally, Bill George to Barb's right 
is a current evening student. He's in the battle of it right now, close to halfway through? Yeah, about 40%. Yeah, starting in my second, third. Okay, okay. So, uh, and, and he works in the Cook School of Business. So he's a colleague by day, a student in the evening. So he can tell you uh, what goes on and in, in what goes on in the B School, those types of things, and the types of requirements and the commitments. So let me get started. I'm going to go ahead and pass these out uh, like most faculty members which I am not, I'm somewhat reluctant, because everybody looks at these and, instead of listens, but I'll get these in front of you. There's four you probably need there for the gentleman behind you. Um, Barb, I saw you jump up. Do you want to help? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll go through this. So Scott gave a very good overview of um, There we go. Okay. This page I think is always interesting because you're here thinking about graduate business education, but you know what does that mean? We have been around for a long time. St. Louis University is coming up on its 200th anniversary in 2018. So we've been a long-standing institution. I look at this list and it always makes me a little tired and I think it probably makes Susie's head swim a little bit too, but we have ultimate responsibility directly or indirectly for most of these programs. These are all graduate level programs or certificates in the College of Business. Now what does that mean to you as a potential MBA student? Well it means we don't take graduate education lightly and we are a full service provider. We have faculty expertise in many areas. We also cut across the campus. We have dual degrees with the law school, Masters of Health Administration, the Med School, the School of Education, and our newest dual degree is a Masters in Sustainability along with the MBA. So we're pulling expertise and resources from other parts of campus as well, as well as some non-degree certificates. Okay, most of you are here tonight thinking about an MBA. Well, well why an MBA? What, what, what do you think that's going to do for you? Okay, we've come up with four major categories why we think and, and other researchers think why people want to get an MBA. Okay, knowledge and perspective is almost a given. Okay, I'll guarantee you if you come here and you take Ben Mamoon's international business class, Bill can probably support this, you will have a different perspective on how the world operates, how business operates internationally. Okay? There's knowledge. Dr. Alderson was here in finance, Dr. Benari in economics. So there's models, there's theories, there's experience and application that comes from that. So this one is, is pretty, pretty well understood. The other one is, I have found in almost 20 years of doing this now, MBA students tend to be pretty practical. They like the knowledge and perspective, they like the education, but they want to go see Barbara Dalla in her office and say, what is that going to mean for me? How can I leverage that knowledge and experience to go to the next level of my career or change careers and move into something entirely different? Sometimes MBA students know what they don't want to do. They've been an engineer for six years, but they're not sure what they do want to do. So career is important. Here's one I think that is somewhat slighted, is the networking opportunity. I hope that our graduates walk out of here with eight to 10 very, very good contacts of classmates that they'll stay in touch with for an extended period of time. I think that's extremely important. That network can serve you well for an extended time. And I think that plays out in career resources as well, building that network. Okay? When I went back to get my MBA, I had been a sales and marketing guy. One of my closest classmates was an engineer and a production guy. I learned so much from him, and I still stay in touch with him. If I was the sales guy that said, sure, you want it built that way, we'll sell it to you. And then that order went into the factory. And my friend was the guy in a different business who had to build it. It's like, well, we can't build it that way. So that network can help with your education, 
It can also help with your career. Now this is a term very few people grasp at first. Signaling. Anybody want to hazard a guess what that might mean? <laughs> well, only because I think that may be my, uh, my priority, and I've only recently realized it. I, I, I've been fundraising. I don't want to be in fundraising the rest of my life. And I want, I want letters out to my name that very specifically say what I know and what I'm qualified to do. OK. And that, that is a signal, signal to, to the business community, right. potential employers, things like that, right. to allow you to make a transition. Exactly. OK. Is that what signal? Am I right? It, it, that's, <laughs> that, I think it can. That's really, I think, at the ultimate level. Let's bring it down. In economics, we studied micro and then macro. Micro was kind of the mini version. OK. Alex goes to work tomorrow. And his colleague says, hey, Alex, what did you do last night? And Alex says, I went to the PMBA session. Yeah, I, went, I stopped by SLU and listened to about their MBA program. OK, what does that signal to Alex's colleague? Signals that he's interested in looking at education and possibly furthering himself. OK, let's say Alex enrolls in a MBA program. I hope it's this one, but it may be others. OK, that then gets to be known around the office, around the company. OK, Alex is signaling he wants to learn more, showing that, that he can do more. So that's really where signaling can be picked up. So I think that was kind of like the micro example, which I've normally used. But Bill, I think that was a, a good example at the, more, at the more macro level. So we've really talked about <laughs> how these four distinct areas about why I get an MBA, there's really an interrelatedness. The network can help your knowledge and perspective. Okay, any accountants here tonight? Okay, accountants make great MBA students. Do we want a whole class of accountants in the MBA classroom? No disrespect, but we don't. <laughs> engineers, any engineers? Okay. We don't want a whole class of engineers in the program. Why? They tend to think a lot the same way because of their prior education. Each one of those is valuable. But what happens in the classroom then is you bring that collective knowledge together and share. So you've got the interrelatedness of a network with the knowledge, the network, and also the career. And the career ties into the signaling. So it all works together. OK. So that first question is, why an MBA? Now the question is, why St. Louis? OK, you came tonight. We have a good program. But as Scott Safransky said, we know we're not the only program in town. We are a good fit for many students. But I learned a long time ago in business, you cannot be everything to everybody. But what we do feel we have is a very, very good mix or blend of quality, cost, and flexibility. OK? The quality, and I'll talk a little, a little bit more about it, Scott already talked about it, it is the accreditation, which is, is a standard that, that we adhere to. The cost, we're not the least expensive program in the city. We're not the most expensive program. We kind of hit a soft spot right in the middle zone there, where we feel we're offering value. Okay, And then flexibility. And, and I'm going to save that for maybe when Bill speaks in a couple minutes about flexibility when it's needed in the program, that if he has responsibilities, either work, family, he can he can adjust his schedule accordingly. So I'll save that one. OK, the quality not only includes accreditation, which we've had now for 65 years, and we do have some highly ranked programs, especially in international business, entrepreneurship, and supply chain. Our evening MBA program by US News and World Report was ranked 32nd last year and in Business Week 37th for the whole country. In the Midwest, those came out to number four and number five for the whole Midwest region, which was about 18 states. So we're very proud of that. We take rankings with a grain of salt, though, because what the Lord gives you, the Lord can also take away. <laughs> we have a lot of alums. We have a lot of alums that stay in the St. Louis region. Again, that network. That network, but we have alums around the world. OK, 
Okay. Any of you know that we were a Jesu Jesuit university before you came over here tonight? Okay. From research or knowledge about living in St. Louis or research? research? Okay. Anybody attend a previous Jesuit uh, high school or university? Okay. Okay. Where'd you go to college? Yeah, I came to Slip. Slip, and then <laughs> good choice. Slip. Uh, I slip and also Jesuit high school. Okay, in St. Louis? No, I'm not in Dallas. Okay. Okay. All right. <clears throat> well, the Jesuit tradition is really women and men for others, and then also with a long tradition of values based education. The bottom line, profit, are very important to business, but the value based aspect of it. Are we doing it eth ethically? Are we doing it morally responsibly? So we look at those things. I think in many cases, some business schools have lost sight of that. Most people in this room may be too young to remember companies like Enron, Adelphia, Tyco International, and others okay, that really, really went the wrong way. We try to take that integrated business perspective along with the global perspective and then tie it into personal and professional development. Accreditation, Scott spoke about, less than one third of the US business schools have it, less than 10% worldwide. Basically, it's a standard that we have to adhere to as every accredited business school does. This is an accreditation not for the university, which most have. This is an accreditation specifically for business schools. So they're looking at the quality of the faculty. They're looking at the quality of the students, we admit. They look at the success of our alums. They're looking more and more now with assessments. Are the students learning what you're saying you're teaching to them? This is peer review. So other schools that have AACSB accreditation review us every five to six years. And they value the accreditation, so they take it very, very seriously. And we've had it continuously since 1948. We take great pride in that. The thing that Scott said, and I'll be reinforcing it, is MBA programs have proliferated in the last 20 years. There's so many schools now offering an MBA. More and more organizations are starting to look and see where the MBA degree is being granted. And they're deferring more and more to AACSB accreditation. So we'd love to have you entertain an, an application here, but if you don't think we're a fit for you, as Scott said, there's three others in the area. So besides us, WashU, UMSL, and SIU Edwardsville. If anybody wants to talk about that later, I'll be here when we break. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Susie for program of study and walk you through the curriculum, both the evening and the full time, because they are slightly different. Thank you. So as Jim mentioned, I'm the associate director here at uh, for graduate programs at the Cook School. Um, so my job is mostly in academic advising. So if you were to come here as a student, I would serve as your academic advisor. I do scheduling. I do all the operational duties, all the day-to-day -day work that goes on in, in running all of the graduate programs here at the Cook School. So how many of you here tonight are interested in the evening, the uh, part-time MBA program? And that's usually what most of our students come with an interest in. So we have a 48-hour uh, um, program of study, and it's actually a 36 to 48 hour because there are 12 hours that can be waived. And those are in what we call the foundation courses. So accounting, statistics, operations management, economics. And those are basically done on transcript review. The criteria in a nutshell is, is that you need to have those classes, have taken those classes, equivalent courses within the last five years and earn a degree at B or better. And like I said, those are upon review of your transcript when you apply to the program. And depending on, so if you come in with the, bat, with the BSBA in finance or economics or whatever, you know, it's likely you could be eligible for course waiver. And basically, those courses just go away. Your, your, your program hours required for degree at that point go down by that incremental amount. So whether it's three credit hours, six, nine, or 12. And then after that, we have what we call breadth courses, and there's no waiver for these. There is vertical substitution. So for example, you come in with a finance degree, then you can vertically substitute out of the finance class, which means you can just take a higher level one and, and fill those credit hour requirements. But you're still on, you're still responsible for the credit hour requirements. 
And the breadth courses are what you would expect. You know, IT and marketing, finance, management, um, international business. Um, and then we have what I call, you know, we have book it, we have required courses, and what I call these two are the bookend courses. Management 603 is our, um, it's legal, ethical, professional environment and business, but it's the class we have all of our new students take. And we're not a cohort program in the evening. Students take classes at their own pace. But what we do ask is that all of our incoming students take this class as their first class, and then they meet other people that are at the same point of the program. And also, Career Services does a session in that class, so you get to know you get to know a little bit about how Career Services works. And Barb's going to talk about that a little bit later. I'm not going to steal her thunder. And Strategy and Practice is our capstone, and that would be the last course you take. And then we've incorporated some new um, classes into the curriculum. We have um, Organizational Effectiveness. These are professional development classes, so presentation skills, um, personal branding things like that that are going to help you from a personal development perspective. And also analytics. And I guess any of you need to hear the term big data. <laughs> so yeah, we're, we're, we're hearing this from employers that they want people with, with analytics skills. They want people that are able to, to process massive amounts of data. And we've got courses now in the curriculum that are required for a degree you know, to meet those, to meet that demand. And then you have nine hours of electives. So there's a, we have a, a lot of flexibility in the program. Class meets uh, 6 to 9 p.m. and one night a week for 13 weeks during the regular term. So next, next Wednesday is when our fall semester starts. And you know if you're taking supply chain management, you're going to be here next Wednesday night from 6 to 9 p.m. and you'll be here every Wednesday for 13 weeks taking that class. And you know, management 600 would be on Monday, or you know, so that's one night a week. Our students typically take two classes per semester, so they're usually on campus two nights a week. Though some will take one per semester, and some will take three because they really like being on campus. I suppose. <laughs> um, we have six terms per year, so we have your, the traditional fall and spring, which are pretty self-explanatory. We have two six-week terms in the summer, which are creatively titled Summer 1 and Summer 2. So one of them starts at May 20, I think, you know, about the 20th of May. The other starts about the first week of July. And those classes would be two nights a week for six weeks. So then the class would be 12 times. So you get the idea. You know, the class would meet 12 to 13 times per year or per term. And then we have what we call intersession, which are these four-week condensed courses. And we're running one right now. So um, Ben Mamoon, who was here earlier, is actually teaching an intersession class tonight. And those meet three nights a week for four weeks. And he's up in Cook 330, which is right up above us. So after this, if you want to sit in on his class, you're more than welcome. You're more than welcome to do so. He told me you were all invited. <laughs> and uh, so we, I talked a little bit about the waiver policy. Again, this is something that is based on transcript review. Um, please don't ask, oh, well, I, I do statistics at work or I do accounting at work. No, it has to be something that's, that's measurable on a transcript that we have to see that you have had this coursework. Um, we also do vertical substitution. So say you have a finance degree and you're like, well, I don't want to take you know, this, the, the 600 level finance course. I want to take real estate finance instead or venture capital instead. That option is available. If you know, so you don't have the redundancy. And this is something that we offer that uh, you take advantage of after the program. And this is and this is something I think is very unique to the Cook School. And I'm seeing more and more alumni take advantage of that. And that is, we offer alumni the opportunity to audit courses for fifty dollars credit hour. So after you graduate, you're like, man, I never got to take that blank, you know, that entrepreneurship course that advertising management course. Oh, I heard this professor was really, really cool and I never got to take this course. We can come back and audit it. And, and it's a really, you know, that's a really great deal. So, um, John, Jim mentioned the Jesuit, you know, the fact that it's a Jesuit University. And I think this is something else that we do at the Cook School that is a really, that gives us a really big edge over a lot of our other accredited competitors in town. And this is the GevNet network and 
you know, how many of you think you're in a job that might get transferred someday? You know, you think you might be moving to Chicago, or Cincinnati, or Omaha, or Seattle? Oh. <laughs> I see it a lot because I see students that come back and halfway through their program of study, you know, got someone that works for Boeing and they find out they're being transferred to Seattle. I mean, in most circumstances, if you were at another accredited school, you could only take six hours with you and say you'd already completed 18. Sorry, you can only take six. But if you are here at SLU and you get relocated, or maybe your spouse gets a job somewhere else, and there's a Jesuit school there, and we've got a lot of them, all credit hours transfer. So say you completed those 18 hours and you've got 30 hours left, well, you can go to University of Seattle or you can go to Loyola. And you can take all of your credit hours with you and just pick up where you left off. Degree is awarded based on where you take 50% of your classes or more. So say you completed 30 hours here and you had 18 remaining, then you would get a diploma from SLU. But if it was the other way around, you'd get a diploma from the school you went to. And I cannot stress enough that this is, this is huge. You know, like I said, graduate school, you don't get to transfer courses back and forth. And if it was an accredited school, it's only six hours. So, you know, I've, I've seen more and more people take advantage of this program, and I think this is something that really is a huge differentiator of that we have over a lot of the other competitors in the area. And um, even some of these universities, uh, Scranton, for example, has an online MBA, and we had a young man who was a Division One college basketball player here. His name is Kevin Lish, and he was a you know, standout on the Williams basketball team. Well, he was in the MBA program here. And you know what happened? He got drafted to play professional basketball in Australia. And he wanted to finish his MBA. He finished through Scranton. He took his, few, his remaining 12 to 15 hours through Scranton and got his slew MBA. And there's no other way that he could have done that. It is a great insurance policy. Mm -hmm. Most of our students may never need it, but you, you just never know. And and some, it's not just it is a transfer quite often. But I mean, Susie works with these people a lot. Sometimes it's just a, a great job opportunity that yeah. they would like to take advantage of. And in the traditional hierarchy of grad schools, without JebNet, they wouldn't be able to do it because they said they've got too much invested in their education. So it really enhances the flexibility we talk about. And so I had a student in, in the other day, and it was because his wife is finishing up her PhD at WashU, and she's taking a postdoc position out in the Baltimore area. So he's looking at Loyola, Maryland, to finish his degree. And this isn't he was looking for a job transfer. It's that his wife was in a PhD program and has found a postdoctoral position outside of the St. Louis area. So he's going to take advantage of it. I want to spend a few minutes on the one year. Did anybody come in to uh, learn a little bit more about our one-year MBA, our full-time MBA program? Okay, so this program is a cohort program, which means it has a it has a you know everybody everybody takes classes together. We have one start a year, and that is at the end of May. So the day after Memorial Day, we have what we call we call it boot camp, orientation and boot camp. And this is what this calendar looks like this year for the one-year MBA. It looked very very similar for academic year 2013 through 2014, 2015. So we go through a summer semester, which we call RED. <laughs> red, yellow, green, three semesters. And the, the, the summer semester, I'll show you in a minute what it looks like. It's 22 hours and 14 weeks. So we so students in the one-year MBA program will do about 40% of their coursework in the summer. It's very much a front-loaded program. That summer is very intense, very accelerated. And then they get to the fall semester, which starts the same time as our graduate business students in the evening MBA program and the specialized master program start. Winter break, there's an embedded study abroad in our one-year MBA program, so everybody goes to Hong Kong, and it's like the most awesome part of the whole year. And um, it is after an extended winter break, spring semester comes in, and then graduation, and then we start the whole thing over again about 10 days later. <laughs> so this really is a year-round program for us in the Graduate Business Programs Office. This is what the summer schedule looks like. So if anybody wants to do the one-year MBA, 
Um, these are all classes. There's 14 classes on here. If you want to count them, I'll let you, but you trust me. And this was uh, this was a week ago. So they just finished. So they're all kind of tired right now. So they, they have break this week. That doesn't always happen. The year I did the one year MBA program, there was no week off. There was Labor Day, and then there was back in class. And that was it. You know, We were back in class by this time just because of the way the academic calendar works. Um, I, I need this week. I'm so glad we yeah. had it. I didn't realize there wasn't one previously. Oh my gosh, oh. no. And oh. my husband uh, took a uh, had a three week trip to South, three business trip to South America. So the day I had off, I took him to the airport. There you go. And you know, I'm in class that Wednesday morning, and I'm getting you know, not that you're supposed to text in class or take phone calls, but I mean, when you know your husband texts you and says he just landed in Sao Paulo, it's like okay, I'll glad to hear that. Thanks. <laughs> so. And then I talked about the study abroad. We do have study abroad in the evening program. It's just not embedded into the program. I strongly encourage you to, if you, you know, whether you come here or you go somewhere else, you know, look at a study abroad. It is, it is so much fun. It is such a great experience to learn, especially if you're interested in international business. I mean, just period, you should do study abroad because it is such an eye-opening, amazing experience. So for our full-time program, we go to Hong Kong. And they have classes here. They have projects that they work on here. And then they go over to Hong Kong and they meet with business people and work on whatever project they've been assigned to for the class. And the full-time program, the cost of the airfare and the cost of lodging is embedded into your tuition cost. So our full-time program costs a little bit more. It's, it's charged more flat rate for tuition. And over the course of the program, it does cost more than our evening program. But part of that is because the trip to Hong Kong is embedded within it. And like I said, we do have optional study abroad for evening students, either to Hong Kong. Again, we have a gentleman in the Department of International Business that takes a group over, sometimes to Beijing as well. And then also, there's a trip at the end, actually the very, very start of the summer semester in the spring. But it's actually technically the end of spring, but it's summer semester. Um, to, to our campus in Madrid. So in case any of you didn't know, SLU does have a campus in Madrid, mostly utilized by our undergraduate students. But we do have study abroad there. I know the law school has a class over there this summer as well. So I'm going to hand over to Barbara Dalla, who is director of our Career Services Center. And she's going to talk about the career resources that the university provides. And you, Susie. she will do an awesome job. <laughs> well, so I, it seems like most of you are interested in, in um, the part-time program, the evening program. But even for those of you who are, who are interested in the full-time program, the services that we provide to students around career are exactly the same. The, the structure and the format is a little bit different. But in the evening, for the evening program students, um, all the services that we provide are available to you, much like they are exactly as they are for the full-time students. And they're listed here. Basically, we have one person who's, who's a dedicated career advisor for, for our graduate students. And she is available to meet individually. Um, and and that, the topics of those conversations can include many things. They can include, what am I going to do with this degree? I know I'm not happy. I know I want to advance my career in business. But I'm not really sure what I want to do or how I can do it. And we have assessments and a number of tools that, that she can work with you on to, to help you figure out what your next step is and based on some key factors that contribute to career satisfaction. She um, can also help with resume and cover letter, updating and writing and, and fine tuning, mock interviews, um, helping develop a strategy for get, moving you forward to the, to the place you want to be through this degree. And that service is available to you while you're a student and also as an alum, which is another awesome uh, addition. Uh, there aren't a lot of schools that offer services to alums anymore. Or if they do, they, they charge a fee for that. And at this point, we have always offered services to alums. And when you find yourself, if you find yourself in the transition and you want some support for that, we're here to help you. In terms of um, big picture, our office really does, aside from the individual services, focus on events. We try to create opportunities for 
students and alums to, to learn more about the world of business and about opportunities and, um, and grow professionally as a result of that. So we try to sponsor one or two networking events each semester. Uh, one of those networking events is with alumni. We invite alums of graduate business programs to come back and meet with students, with current students, to talk about informally about their business, their industry, their, their career path, how they leverage their MBA. And, and they represent all kinds of industries and, and career paths. So that's a really fun opportunity, really low key and, um, and unstructured, so you have an opportunity to meet with alumni in small groups and, and interact and, and uh, forward your network, networking building. And then we also have um, opportunities, speakers, different kinds of interesting people that come to speak. First, sometimes employers will come to talk about opportunities, and those are for, for those who are job seeking. But we also have some interesting speakers that come back on a regular basis to talk about professional development topics like how do you um, how do you create a strategy to advance your career? Speakers who've done organizational development work, speakers who are consultants. We have um, a friend in the, the publisher of the Business Journal, Ellen Sherbert. She comes back every year to talk about using the Business Journal in your professional life, how to how to utilize it and leverage it for your own use. So we have a lot of different offerings, a lot of executive speakers that come in and offer. A perspective of leadership that's that's really interesting as well. Now, to just speak a little bit to the um, to the full time MBA, to those that are interested in the full time MBA, there is there is a professional development career management type component uh, right in the program as part of the curriculum of the full time program, and. And we, we offer classes and, and of course, the, the individual assistance as well in, in a lot of those foundational skill building, like, like assessing what you want to do next, getting your resume uh, revised and, and targeted to the industries that you're, that you're looking at, and um, some other more specialized uh, services and, and offerings for job seeking students. So, we really were committed to, to our students and, it, and the, um, the investment of that piece into the program, as well as Susie mentioned, we come into the evening program as well for one class session to kind of kick off that professional development topic and, and uh, help move it forward. But it, it really demonstrates the Cook School's commitment to students in, in advancing their careers. So. Um, that is it in a nutshell. And can I? Are there any questions that I can answer about careers? Yeah. Um, sure. From your perspective and your department's perspective, can you talk a little bit about the list that's typically seen in career trajectory by your graduate students? We we collect statistics for our um, full time program, which which many universities do, and we have those statistics, and we typically see. Um, it's a huge range in salary and a, and a significant range in, in jump of, of title as well. Um, but typically, but we have more anecdotal information for our evening MBA program, so that's a little harder to capture. Um, but typically, that jump happens either in the latter half of the program at graduation or even, even to, up to two years afterwards. And so we don't have specifics on that, but um, but uh, we can offer you the this employment statistics for the for the full time MBA. Okay. That's of interest to you. Sure. Any other questions? Well, then it is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague Bill George, who is going to give you a little bit of reflection and answer questions about the. Um, being a student in this program. No, this will be easy. Because <laughs> there's nothing compared to worry about. I'm powerful. Um, I have to take any of your questions. I, I won't hold back just because my colleagues are in the room. Um, I've worked at SLU 
five years uh, full time. I'm director of development for the John Cook School of Business. So Barb helps you make more money in your job, and I ask you to give it back. <laughs> uh, Jim, are you going to say something? No, I was going to say I wanted to make it clear that you're not part of our office, nor are you part of career That's correct, services. Yeah. Totally you're a office. separate entity of the B School. But I like the analogy, though. Yeah, yeah. That's great. It's very simple. <laughs> Um, being a full-time employee, does that help to pay your tuition? Yes, it does. We receive a very generous uh, tuition remission. Um, and in fact, if any of you are thinking of working for SLU, I highly recommend it um, because my children also receive tuition remission at Jesuit universities if they qualify to get into those universities. Um, or they can come here, which you know, is a pretty nice deal. Uh, so yeah, that's that's how I'm paying for it. Absolutely. Um, I will say, Aaron. Aaron asked me an interesting question that I hadn't really considered, and, and that was uh, just sort of like the 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 wear and tear of the schedule of you know, working all day, going to school at night. Um, and I told him, you know what? I'm, I'm 56 years old. Um, my, my my kids are older. Um, you know, and I don't know what it'd be like if I had young elementary school age or younger children still. But, um, you know, I, I work all day. Granted, it's not his digging, but um, I'm here all day and always try to take two courses um, a term. And, you know, it, it works out fine. I've made it through. Um, and I'm doing this, I will tell you, after major heart surgery. So <laughs> that has not held me back in any way, shape, or form. So, um, I guess uh, something else I can speak to. First of all, I, if you've got the time, I highly encourage you to take Ben Mamoon up on his uh, offer to sit in on his class. When, when I came to the MBA information session about a year and a half ago to learn more about the program, um, they used to offer a, a mini class for like 20 minutes. and they would ask, often ask Ben to do it, but asking Ben to hold anything for 20 minutes is, is you know, like trying to hold back the time. Um, I, I have to tell you, I had no interest in international business whatsoever. I took it because it required. I heard you know, good things about Ben, but didn't know him. Um, and can't tell you how much I enjoyed the class, how much amazing stuff I learned. Um, and um, you know, you've also heard about the flexibility tonight. I will tell you, you know, we had a we had a paper due. Now, I mean, this isn't accounting and it wasn't finance, you know, what I kind of think of as the hard sciences of business. But uh, we had a paper due, and it, yeah, I can't remember. I was, I was analyzing, you know, China and protectionism and, and just way out of my depth, okay? I was a theater major 25 years ago. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I just, you know, I, I, I kind of threw up my hands. I had all this research and I just, couldn't quite pull it together, and I just I emailed Ben. I said, you know what? I, here are the sources. You know, here's my kind of thesis, but I, you know, I don't know where I am with that. Can I have an extension? You know, will it take a great cut? And, you know, we worked out a very amicable deal. Um, something uh, that I found is that all the professors, whether they're full-time, you know, tenured faculty or you know, adjunct professionals in their own life, you know, who come in and teach in the evening. They're well aware that they're teaching working professionals um, and are, are very considerate and cognizant um, of your time and your commitments. Um, and and you know, I've yet to meet anyone who won't you know, work with me on you know, whatever crisis du jour I might have to have. Um, the uh, class is in three what? 3.30, he's upstairs. 3.30, so directly upstairs in the same hallway upstairs. If that works for you tonight, Ben is always open to visitors. But we, I will tell you that no matter when, if you'd like to come back and sit in on a class after our fall semester starts next week, if you have an interest in accounting or marketing, whatever it might be, I think that's a great thing to come in and not only see the dynamics of a class, but, but see who the students are. Maybe, Bill, you want to talk a little bit about some of the diversity of your students? And the, I mean, you're, here's a theater, you know, you're a theater major. Not too many of you yeah. guys running around. 
<laughs> so I will tell you, I, I, I broke the rules a little bit. You know, Susie mentioned we we like everybody to start with that legal, ethical, professional environment or business class, and I, I highly recommend doing that. It's a great class, taught by a great guy. Um, but I, you know, because I work here, people know me. They cut me a little slack, and I actually started last summer. And I right out of the box, I took uh, you know marketing management, which is a great class, team-based approach. So boom. Day one, we're in teams. Here's your case. You know, you're going to present. You know, in four weeks' time on this case, come up with your PowerPoint. And you know, one guy in my team worked with Brown Shoe. One guy worked at um, Samus, uh, and um, the other guy worked here at SLU, but was sort of at the end of the MBA program, right? And here I am, my first business class ever. And I just said to the, you know, we sat down to start with the, and I said to the guy, just said, you know what, here's what I bring to the table. I'm a performer. You put together the PowerPoint, you do the numbers, you know, I'll try and keep up, but I'm more than happy to get up and talk for 15 minutes about this case. Um, and you know what, it worked. The guy from Savas, I mean, he was he was a back office numbers guy. He you know, had all of these scenarios and yada yada. Um, uh, it, it's been a real education for me, first of all, just in learning what kind of careers are out there? You know, I'm in class with people from Express Scripts, Boeing, you know, small private. One guy who was on a, a team in my um, accounting class uh, works for a, a small private company that goes all over the world designing and repairing boiler systems. Um, who knew? Um, <laughs> but you know, and, and they're, they're really in demand because. You Imagine there are a lot of those companies that do that. Um, so it, it's it's very very rich that way. Um, and, and you know for what it's worth, I was not raised Catholic. Uh, I, I married uh, a SLU alumna. Um, I have a real affinity for the Jesuit tradition, both as an employee and now as a student. Uh, it really does make a difference. I I worked at UMSL for seven years before I came to SLU, and you know what, UMSL is a great institution, um, but there's a big difference between a public university and a Jesuit university, and you know it's 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 somewhat intangible, but it's also the fact that the Jesuits have been doing this for over 400 years. Um, they they know they the people who work in Jesuit institutions. Um, Come to know about a lot about um, face to face individual teaching. And you know, it's, it's palpable. Yes? Yeah. Uh, what made you initially decide to pursue an MBA? Um, I've been in fundraising for 18 years, started out as a performing arts uh, administration type of things. Um, <laughs> Morphed into higher ed when I was recruited to go work at UMSL. Um, and um, came to SLU, worked a lot of different sort of assignments and, and schools and colleges at UMSL over almost seven years, strictly with the business school here at SLU. Um, I work, you know, my job is to call SLU alumni, engage them, try to, you know, find out what they're passionate about. And ask them to give money to support that passion. Um, first of all, it's a little intimidating talking to business people if you know nothing about business, <laughs> um, and it's hard to remain credible, you know, when you're asking them to give their time and/or treasure back uh, if you can't meet them a little bit on their terms. Um, so there was that. Um, frankly, I grew up hating business. I was going to be an artist. Thank you very much. Um, and. It wasn't until I began meeting a lot of business people that I understood that, oh, you can actually be creative in business. And in fact, some of the happiest people I knew were people who had found ways to channel their creativity through their career in business. Um, a lot of accountants actually managed to do that. It was really good anyway. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, to me, it, it came down to, um, I realized I'd always been afraid of business. So for me, part of it was just conquering fear of what I never knew and or thought I didn't like. Um, coupled with the fact that, um, you know, I'm 
coming in to say, you know, in the last quarter of my you know career, certainly of not my life, um, and um, academically, I'm qualified to you know be an actor, be a director, do some design work, um, and in terms of Fundraising, you know, fundraising is one of those areas that nobody goes to school to learn how to do. Everybody falls into it by, you know, some means or other. And um, I don't necessarily want to continue fundraising for the rest of my active career. Um, I work in a school of business. It's almost free. You know, if I got an MBA, at the very least, I'm going to be qualified to do many other things. And hopefully along the way, I will also you know, find some interest and passion um, for something that will, you know, allow me to take another step. So that's why I'm doing it. Opportunity met uh, <laughs> availability, I guess. Any other questions for Bill? Yes, please. How challenging do you find it to balance working all day and then going to class and also getting all of your assignments and whatever you need done? projects for the next week? Um, I, I find it very doable. Um, I, um, with the caveat that I've not had finance yet, and I'm <laughs> about to take statistics, so you know, those are, in terms of the entry courses, you know, the, the beginning, those those are kind of two biggies, uh, for me anyway, because the last math class I had was in, oh dear God, 1993. Um, so, uh, Copernicus teaching? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, just in terms of life schedule, not a problem. Now, I, you know, I'm really very fortunate. I, the other nice thing about fundraising, it's a pretty flexible job. Um, not unlike sales, you know, the, the skill set and, and, and the requirements are pretty similar to sales. Um, so, like I said, if I was doing something a little physically more demanding every day, that would be one thing. And or something that required more, you know, more than just nine to five, eight to five. Um, you know, the fundraising also involves a fair number of special events. Um, and there are times during the year, October for instance, <laughs> where it's going to get pretty intense. You know, I'll be here starting at 7 in the morning for an event, and you know, I won't leave until you know, 9, 15 at night. Um, but you know what, it's only one or two nights a week for 13 weeks. And you know, I answer first. <laughs> you can do it. Absolutely. Time management skills, huge. Sure. And, and again, just to, to reiterate, um, you know, people have to travel for the job. And frankly, you've got to miss a final. Um, actually, a really good case of point. Um, in the legal environment of uh, business ethics, etc. class, um, anybody here work for Express Scripts? Okay. Well, there were several folks in my class that worked for Express Scripts, and um, just from a timing standpoint, there was this weird thing where they had to have their final grades into HR in order to be reimbursed for that term, but the deadline was the day before the final, so they could possibly have their final grades. Um, and the professor, now this man, he's an adjunct, okay? He's a full-time CEO of uh, an industrial supply company here in St. Louis. He's taught the class for, I don't know, at least eight years, also has a law degree. Uh, great guy, really engaging teacher. You know what, he came in two days early, set it up so the Expressive's employees come in, take the final, and he got it graded two days ahead of time, and got it, you know, so they could get their reimbursement back from Express Scripts. So that's the kind of flexibility and, and sort of you know, extra mile that the faculty are willing to go for. Okay. Hope to see you. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Can you hang around for a minute if there's any one other Matt, questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, this pretty much concludes our session for tonight. If there's questions that you have, uh, we can stay and, and answer those for you. Hopefully this was informative.
Um, one thing that I will tell you, wherever you might go thinking about education in general, one thing that I've learned over the years, and, and Bill would probably support this, Susie is a recent alum, that education is not a spectator sport, it's a participant sport. The students that sit in the back of the room and don't engage very much probably don't get a whole lot out of the experience. But if you engage and, and are a participant in your education, I think that's that's huge. Now, some faculty like Ben makes everybody a participant. It's hard not to be a participant in Ben's class, uh, and, and a few others like that. But I, but I think that that's true. Uh, that it's just like anything else. You're going to get out of it what you put into it. So. Uh, thank you for coming. If you have any individual questions, we'll be around for a few minutes. Grab some crackers or chips or anything else there on the way out. And um, our contact information is in the handout if you have follow-up questions. If you want to go up to Ben Mahmood's class, we can walk you up there. Um, they will probably take a break around 7.30. So if you would just want to see a snippet of his class, but my guess is if you go for 30 minutes, you'll want to stay for the rest of it. But I don't know. That's up to you. I would be surprised if he calls on them. Yeah, he'll have you participate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He, he likes yeah, but to that's do okay. It. It's okay. Because he feels everybody's got something to contribute in the discussion. So, um, but if you, like I said, this fall, if you'd like to sit in on a class in a subject area that you're interested in, let us know. Um, our spring semester for the evening program will start in early February. So we're looking at applications right now for that time frame. Uh, applications consist of basically completing the online app, standardized test, either the GMAT or the GRE, all of your transcripts, undergrad and or graduate transcripts for the evening for the evening program, two personal references, and then a personal statement about why an MBA, why SLU, basically why now, this stage of your life. So we'll stay around and answer any questions. Um, anybody interested in going upstairs? OK. Yeah. Is that a three? OK, you are. Let me take them up and Barb, Susie, Bill can answer questions. If not, have a safe drive home and thanks for coming out. He's teaching international business in the fall, so that's true. Yeah, that's what I'm getting. Yeah, I would say, yeah. 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 So we have the third thing next week. So it's very, I believe, it's going to be session. So it's going to be session. So accounting, IT, and marketing, with the exception of accounting, they were all uh, case-based. So lecture and uh, teams, case uh, each week, they're ready to do work. Surprisingly enough, all the